In this lecture, we begin our unit on the healthcare system and how people utilize the healthcare system. We're going to spend a lot of time in this unit looking at the structure and some of the strengths and weaknesses of the American healthcare system. Um, you might sort of wonder as we're doing this, you know, well, this isn't a course in healthcare economics or in the healthcare system. You know, why does this fit? Well, as you watch some of the arguments and the information, the documentaries we're going to watch about the healthcare system, listen carefully for important words like uh, beliefs and ideas, uh, incentives, behaviors. Uh, when we look at the healthcare system, it is really about the behaviors of both providers and patients. It's about the way incentives are set up, but it's about the assumptions and beliefs that we take into uh, the healthcare system. And all of that, of course, is psychology. So we're going to be taking a careful look at those issues uh, in this lecture and over the next couple of weeks. Now, a couple of caveats as we jump into this. The first that's important is we're going to be talking about the healthcare system, but the reality is there is no kind of single healthcare system. It's actually a combination of multiple symptoms, uh, excuse me, multiple systems uh, that are interoperating and interacting. Uh, they're also ongoing, constant innovation and creativity. The healthcare system we might encounter. Uh, here in Stillwater or in Oklahoma isn't necessarily the same healthcare system that they might encounter in Florida or California or New York. So uh, things are different in different places. Communities innovate, states innovate, and, and uh, so we talk about it as one big system as a whole, but in reality um, there's quite a bit of diversity across the country. Um, we also know that um, health care and health care compensation, uh, or our primary way of paying for health care through insurance, are quite different issues, although they are interrelated. Uh, they're frequently con confused. You know, most commonly in our political debates, you hear people talk about health care reform. Most of that legislation has been about health insurance reform, not really about changes to health care. They're interrelated, no doubt, but they are somewhat different issues. One of the also another challenge for us as citizens in understanding our healthcare system is we get most of our information through the media. And in general, the media struggles to cover health issues in ways that help our understanding. Um, they often oversimplify very complex issues. There's a couple websites here might be worth visiting at some point to poke around that are uh, websites devoted to uh, both improving health journalism and improving the consumer's ability to interpret and use uh, media reports of health and health care issues. Now a couple things about our health care system. Uh, one is there are many, many different kinds of providers, and in this uh, context we're really talking about physicians primarily as providers. Um, you know, there's doctors, but there are many, many kind of doctors. Uh, first off, there's generalists, people who work in primary care or family practice, who kind of are the frontline providers who see people when they're experiencing symptoms and kind of take care of most health care needs. There's also providers who specialize by population. What types of folks do they specialize in treating? Uh, pediatricians who treat kids and adolescents or gerontologists who treat older adults. There are providers who specialize on the setting in which they work. Some people think of themselves as community practice. They may work in primary care or even in outreach kind of settings, uh, engaged in community health. Uh, there's also folks called hospitalists. Uh, these are folks whose entire practice happens within the hospital and caring for patients who are in the hospital setting. These are just a couple of examples. There's also examples of providers who are specialized by their technical expertise, so surgeons radiologists, or people who focus on trauma. There's providers who specialize by, by a body system, uh, things like orthopedists who focus on bones and joints, uh, neurologists who focus on the brain and the nervous system, gastroenterologists who may focus on the digestive system, or endocrinologists who focus on the endocrine system. And of course there's providers who are specialized by disease or disease state, things like oncologists who focus on cancer, or cardiologists who focus on the heart and the circulatory system. So there's a lot of different kinds of providers in our system. We also know there's lots of other providers, certainly, besides physician. There's, there are some providers, more and more today, who are not physicians but do some things that are similar to a physician in some settings. Uh, things like nurse practitioners or physician assistants are more and more common in both primary care and specialized practice settings.
There are providers that support the work of physicians. Uh, nurses and pharmacists are good examples. And there's other folks that are called uh, generally allied health providers. This includes things like myself, psychologists, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, or speech and language therapists. There are different kinds of settings for healthcare. In general, we break out settings as either inpatient or outpatient. Inpatient settings are defined as those that involve overnight stays and regular ongoing supervision of care, places like hospitals, nursing homes, or rehabilitation hospitals. For many situations, this is required for optimal care. People simply can't be adequately cared for without that kind of um, constant uh, supervision and care, but it's of course very expensive and so we want to use it only when necessary and avoid it um, if possible. It can also be dangerous in the inpatient settings. You'll hear people joke that one of the most dangerous places for your health is to be in the hospital and there's actually some truth to that uh, because hospitals are dangerous places. There's risks of infections, of course medical errors as well. Uh, many doctors will tell their patients that we want you in and out of the hospital as quickly as possible if a hospital stay is required. Then there's outpatient treatment settings. These are those that involve less intense contact with providers typically. At most there may be daily contact but not overnight stays. This is typically conducted in what we would consider a clinic setting or done in a community with outreach. Uh, there's a growing movement today in our system for what's being referred to as retail medicine or doc in the box is kind of a dismissive term for these. These are those places, the urgent care centers you see sometimes on main streets or in strip malls. Um, we're even seeing primary care settings emerge in retail places like uh, pharmacies, like Walgreens, or even in Walmarts. There are Walmarts in the country where you can have sort of quick care, primary care settings right within Walmart, go right over to the Walmart pharmacy and get your health care for some needs met right within a retail setting. And I think we're going to see more and more of that uh, over time. These options are cheaper, but in some ways they're not ideal for some kinds of care and some kinds of problems. Uh, we also know emergency rooms are an important part of our health care system. These are of course ideal for life-threatening or urgent health issues. Um, but it's, of course, the most expensive form of care for most complaints. So your aches and pains, your allergies, your sniffles, your sinus infections, this is not often the best uh, place to go because it's quite expensive. There's very expensive equipment, there's expensive providers and teams of providers, and it's an expensive way to receive care. Unfortunately, emergency rooms are overused by lots of healthcare consumers. Uh, folks who are uninsured, for example, may use the emergency room for almost their exclusive care. Uh, mostly for ethical reasons, uh, the emergency room cannot turn them away, and so you'll go there to get your, your care. There's lots of reforms in place that are constantly attempting to move care away from the ER and toward more efficient and less costly alternatives. Uh, there's a story linked to our content this week of an attempt in Camden, New Jersey, to try to put primary care right in uh, housing complexes to sort of bring the care to the people and deliver it in a more... more uh, cheap alternative, uh, trying to reduce the use of expensive uh, ER visits. There's a lot of challenges in our current system. One is with so many different kinds of providers and so many different kinds of settings, sometimes communication is difficult and that makes coordination of care uh, less than ideal. There's a big movement today, it was part of the Affordable Care Act, to try to get electronic medical records to make it easier for providers in different places caring for the same patient to communicate more effectively. Uh, we know that multiple providers can provide excellent care. Specialists are great, but they're expensive, and how can we uh, maximize the efficiency of that system? One of the big problems is that our consumers, uh, we as patients, are really out of touch with the real cost of health care. Uh, when's the last time you went for health care and as part of the explanation they actually told you what it was going to cost? Not just what it would cost you with insurance, your copay, you might have been aware of that, but what's the actual cost and what's going to be the maximum out-of-pocket cost of expense for you? Uh, health care system is a, kind of a strange place where you don't see any kind of upfront pricing. Um, when you do get medical bills, they're often uninterpretable. You can't tell what that was done or who this provider is, and it's difficult to understand whether you were overcharged or whether you could have made other choices that might have uh, saved money. Uh, the only other place I can think of in, uh, that I've seen in my life where you purchase services without knowing the cost is 
uh, super high-end restaurants where they pass out a menu and uh, you know there's no uh, cost on them. Well, that's for you know folks for who cost is no object, I guess. But our healthcare system is for all of us, so that's a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, some complain too that medical care is too focused on symptom suppression and struggles with managing and certainly with preventing chronic conditions. And I think we're seeing a movement now in our healthcare system moving to more and more emphasis and taking very seriously uh, prevention and early care versus trying to cope with the costs of very expensive illnesses that develop over time if we're not more successful. One of the claims you'll see made in several of the documentaries that uh, we'll be watching as part of this unit is how expensive our health care is here in the U.S. This figure summarizes the uh, cost per capita of the American health care system expressed as a percentage of our GDP or gross domestic product, how much of our economy is spent on health care. And what you see is compared to lots of other advanced Western uh, countries, our peers in the world, uh, we spend some in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 percent more. We spend approximately double what most of the rest of the developed world spends on health care. And you'd expect for that kind of premium price, we'd be getting better outcomes. But actually, we see that we have worse outcomes uh, than many, many countries, including uh, most of those on this list. And so one of the challenges in understanding our current uh, health care system and how to improve it is how do we get better outcomes for cheaper prices. So who utilizes health care? Well, not surprising. Uh, older uh, adults are the most heavy users of health care. People 65 years and older use about double the health care of people in later adulthood and use nearly triple the care of uh, young adults or uh, adolescents and children. We also know that women uh, in uh, adult ages use more health care than men, and this is primarily related to uh, uh, women as uh, childbearing. Um, that's an expensive health care utilization and certainly not a uh, cost or uh, issue uh, that, are, that um, is relevant to men. And so we see in sort of middle adulthood, adult, young and middle adulthood, uh, women using more health care, but at older ages, once childbearing is, is passed and uh, uh, before the age of 18, we see about men and women using health care about equally. We know there's a lot of factors that can decrease or drive down utilization or overutilization. Uh, things like certainly not having the services available, for example. Uh, there may be advances in public health or in prevention that uh, prevent or suppress some of the behaviors that may lead to more health care needs. Treatments that are more effective at curing uh, illnesses are certainly uh, part of this. Uh, guidelines that recommend decreases, so for example guidelines that may uh, create more strict criteria for who needs certain elective procedures uh, can drive down utilization. Advances in technology that allow people to better manage their care or to deliver care in more efficient ways may decrease utilization. Payer pressure, things like uh, increasing co-pays and um, increasing health insurance premiums can be an issue. Uh, changes in practice patterns, so maybe uh, certain kinds of providers just don't see patients or don't see them as often for certain things and that can drive down. And lastly, of course, changes in consumer preferences. There may be some things where consumers decide that they don't, um, they don't want to be medicated for certain things and that may drive down utilization. But there's a lot of factors that increase utilization, things like increased availability of services. Uh, our population in the U.S. is always growing. That increases demand. Our population generally is aging. We're getting more and more older adults um, surviving um, past the age of 65 and long, long past the age of 65, and we know that that increases utilization. New procedures come along, and as kind of if you build it, they will come. Uh, new procedures come along to treat uh, illnesses, and uh, if they're effective, they, there's more demand for those. There sometimes are guidelines that recommend increases. Uh, one of the things we talked about earlier in the class is how often heart disease is missed in women. Well, there's a lot of new awareness and guidelines that are trying to raise uh, the healthcare system's awareness of that issue among women, and that can drive more utilization. Sometimes new diseases come along or outbreaks of infectious diseases, and those are costly and require utilization. Uh, new drugs, like new procedures, can drive demand. 
Uh, there may be increased insurance coverage. One of the things that was part of the Affordable Care Act was requiring insurances to cover certain things that maybe they didn't before. For example, uh, covering mental health or substance use issues, and that can increase uh, demand and utilization as well. There may be consumer pressures for more coverage. Consumers want um, uh, more health care for certain issues. There may be changes in practice patterns. Um, for example, the uh, urgent care centers, the retail care centers I mentioned earlier, increased utilization of that kind of primary care. And there may lastly be changes in consumer preference or demand. Consumers just uh, want new and different things. So that gives us a quick introduction to some of the issues uh, in our healthcare system and related to healthcare utilization.